guys. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Advisory Board Franchise, where we bring in experts from the franchising industry to give you insights into actually what's going on and give you actionable uh, plans of ways you might be able to improve the way that you're operating your franchise or your business. And I've got with me somebody who I've, I've been hoping to get on the podcast for a while, Marcy Kleinsasser. She's the VP of, of Marketing for uh, Home Franchise Concepts. Now, she's also been in the industry for a little while. So uh, what was it, Marcy? You say 30 years? Is that how long? Yeah, I started really young, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> when, she was, when she was five years old, she was in franchising. Um, but Marcy comes from, a, I mean, a little bit of a background in, in, in franchising. I worked with her dad and his franchise during high, you know, wrapping up high school years. Ended up right out of college getting into a franchise um, and working in marketing there. It was on agency side for a little while. But you probably know Marcy because sometimes she's sitting on the stage in panels uh, because she's got a lot of insights to share. And uh, been with to, to your anniversary with Home Franchise Concepts, right? Come on. on, yes. Oh, good for you. So uh, I'm going to brag on you for a second, Marcy. But then I want you to tell us a little bit more about Home Franchise Concepts so everybody knows a bit more. But uh, Marcy's kind of a big deal, guys. She wouldn't say that ever herself. So I get to say it and make her blush, which I kind of enjoy. But uh, she's an IFA franchise committee member, uh, women's committee member. She, she's a top, she was in 2022, Franchise Update Media recognized her as a top four marketing winner for a local marketing innovation. And then uh, last year, she was recognized as a top 50 franchise CMO game changer by Entrepreneur Magazine. I think both are completely appropriate, uh, very well, very well uh, appointed. Marcy, tell us a little bit more about yourself and also tell us a little bit more about home franchise concepts so everybody gets an idea of the, the unique perspective you have on what's going on in the franchise industry. Well, thanks, Dave, for having me, and thanks for sharing some of those um, milestones in my career. Um, first, about myself, um, I started out on the agency side of the desk coming um, off of college. I went to school um, home-based here in South Florida. I've been in South Florida my entire career, originally a Jersey girl, and then my dad said, tired of shoveling snow, moved the family down to Miami, which is where um, I went to high school and originally first two years in college and then moved us north. And as you said, he opened his medicine shop franchise in North Miami. Um, and then I went to Florida International University, studied communications with a minor in marketing and right out of college joined um, an agency division of BBDO um, South. And one of our clients was a small franchise called Burger King. So that was kind of my first taste of franchising outside of what I didn't realize, as you had said, working for my dad's franchise. But again, as a teenager and get going into college, that was just kind of to put some uh, cash in my pocket to go out with the friends on the weekends, right? So I didn't really pay attention to my dad's business, you know, his, his uh, business and what the model was at the time. But looking back, that informed my career um, and I didn't even know it at the time. So started on the agency side um, and then I um, decided, you know, I wanted to get um, some client side background. So I jumped to Domino's Pizza in the Florida region and got a, a really great kind of foundation of what the client side really was all about. Supported over 250 franchise owners, both corporate and franchise in the state of Florida. And I was responsible for eight different regions for them or eight different markets, if you will, in the state of Florida for marketing. And um, then I got recruited back to the agency side to help launch um, a brand that some may have heard of, some may be too young to have heard of, um, but it was a brand called Kenny Rogers Roasters. So um, that was really a fun um, new roasted chicken brand. And it had not only um, the kind of the uh, the glamour, if you will, of working with a celebrity in Kenny Rogers, but also Governor John Y. Brown was the co-founder and he was the former governor of Kentucky and he had a little bit of celebrity as well. So the two of them came together, founded that brand, and it really was a case study in franchising. Um, I should have wrote a book at the time, didn't have a lot of time to do that in that um, we started with 30 restaurants on the agency side. They recruited me to then become their director of marketing and we grew so fast in that 30 restaurants in the agency side, they recruited me when we were about 65 restaurants and I stayed there until um, we were about 350 restaurants internationally. So over a three and a half year period, super fast growth. 
And when you're growing so fast like that in a franchise, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, you do some things right and you do a lot of things wrong. So that's where I really should have wrote um, a, a book in what to do and what not to do in franchising. Um, but needless to say, I moved on to other brands in my career. I worked in Benihana restaurants. I worked um, a short time out of franchising with Alamo Renicar and partnership marketing, but really needed to get back into what I was passionate about, which was helping franchisees launch their brands locally. And so got back into franchising um, with Puro Clean, coverall cleaning concepts, really uh, got into services and home services and really found um, an interest in the services side of marketing and kind of left the restaurant and hospitality um, in the rear view mirror. And so fast forward, I um, got an opportunity with Handyman Connection. I was there for 10 years. And then most recently, I um, was fortunate enough to meet JT Thiessen, who was the chief development officer um, with Home Franchise Concepts. I met him actually through Angela Cote's roundtables during COVID, and we became friends. And had, he um, introduced me to an opportunity at Home Franchise Concepts where they were really just deciding to build out the development side of marketing. And lo and behold, two years ago, I joined Home Franchise Concepts, and here I am. Well, they were lucky to get you, and JT's always been pretty talented at recruiting good folks to work with them. So, uh, yeah, glad glad that's worked out so well for you, and I'm sure for them having you there. Uh, yeah, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. I will tell you, going from most of my career, I've been working with one brand and one company, a, f a few um, opportunities to um, collaborate with other brands, but again, always um, shepherding one brand through their growth cycle. And this has just been amazing to join not only the company that has such an amazing culture and support for their franchise owners, but also working collaboratively across starting nine brands. And then um, last year, we actually incubated and launched um, a, a new brand called Lightspeed Restoration. And uh, these 10 brands are really best in class in their categories. Um, and it's just I feel very fortunate every day to be part of these brands and, and really be in charge of growth and development marketing. So I consider myself very lucky. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. I know a couple of the brands really well, actually. So, uh, yeah, uh, Marcy, thank you uh, for being here. And and I think if you don't mind maybe elaborating on this before we get started, you you kind of hinted at it. But, you know, first time that you've worked in a, in a platform company, it's kind of a unique experience in a really good way, also in many challenging ways. Right. But you have the perspective as you as you work with these these brands that you get to see how the market's interacting and what lead channels are working and all these things for 10 different concepts simultaneously. How, how do you feel that that has altered your perception of and given you insights into franchise marketing? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like I, I like I said, I was was always working on like growing one one baby, and now I kind of have have like ten babies, and you can't have you know your favorite children. But obviously, you have perspectives because they're all different. While while they're all in home services for the most part, they're different verticals. So we're always looking at you know what's going on in window coverings and what's going on in you know kitchen and bath remodel and um the you know the the residential cleaning industry. So I get to look across all those different verticals, but at the same time, um development marketing is similar, if you will, for all of those different verticals. So it gives us unique perspective on our development team since I sit in the development team, but I work cross-functionally across the consumer marketing side, even though I'm on the development side, I work with my consumer marketing um, counterparts, if you will, to make sure that we are bringing on the right candidates so that they can be successful within their brands. Yeah, I hope you guys heard what she just said. But especially smaller and growing brands, sometimes there's a big disconnect between the franchise development team and the consumer team so that that, that you get a mismatch of who's going to be a great franchise owner. That was subtle, and I don't even think you intended to make that a major point, but I just want to highlight it because if you're concerned about or having struggles with uh, franchise unit operations, this is this is a little key that Marcy just shared with us, and it didn't even have anything to do with our, co our concept we're going to cover today, but that was a good nugget. So I want to make sure we pull that out for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Marcy, we're going to jump into some marketing uh, topics today, but but as we do, because of this unique position, would you mind sharing what are some of the things that you're seeing shift in the last, let's say, 90 to 180 days in franchise development marketing? Like, what, what do you see from your perspective with all those data points coming into you? 
Well, I'm definitely seeing a shift in leads. Um, I think from all our different channels, leads are fluctuating. Some months they're better than others, I would say in all of 2024. And you know, we have definitely been from day one, me joining Home Franchise Concepts, focusing on quality. But at the end of the day, you can't get to quality until, you know, it's a numbers game, as you know, Dave, right? So you need a certain number of total leads to get to your quality leads, ultimately to get through the entire um, sales funnel to get to the franchisees that you want to bring in the door that are quality that ultimately are going to be successful all the way through the length of their agreement and hopefully renewing their agreement, right? So um, leads have been kind of fluctuating by channel. And um, that's that's been a little tenuous, if you will. I'm obviously working with our sales advisor team. Um, they they want quality, they want numbers of leads so that they can get to that quality lead and ultimately bring um, the right numbers across the finish line. So that's been interesting. And, you know, we we have a lot of healthy debate on, well, why is that? Is that we're not, you know, in the right channels or if we're in the right channels, why are we not getting the numbers we need? So we have those debates frequently. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, that would be another topic, I think, for a full podcast. But like, why is that? Uh, see, see, I, mean, I, I have a unique spot in that I work with hundreds of brands, right? So I get to talk to them about just this thing and I can just, corroborate like lead volumes are down generally yeah. about 25 30 percent depending on the channel some more some less but um obviously the consumer confidence is softening a little bit even though the headlines might tell us something different but it's an election year so just get offshore news if you want to know what's actually happening but right. uh Anyway, we won't go, we won't get political today. We'll talk about marketing. How about that? No, but that but that affects things. I mean, you you, you know, obviously, if we would just leapfrog over the election election, we could just kind of sigh of relief, put that behind us, and that you know isn't one factor um, that is contributing. We yeah. we can't you know deny that. Right, and it and it's interesting. I saw some some studies on it, but like the concerns of the the presidential it, who it's a. Uh, Oh darn! Franchise Insights published it. I think it might be Fran, okay. but they 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 say what are you know they kind of try to pull out what are the concerns that people have yeah. the consumers have in when buying a business. That was one of the big ones, but it's it's not as high as I would have thought. But then they did they just published the last quarter data and it jumped up and it'll jump up again. And so it's just it's just going to get closer. Going to be yeah. need to be a concern. And then sure. after the election, like you said, sigh of relief, people will get back to business probably Q one of next year, but. And but in, in the meantime, we still have some franchises to grow. So we got to figure out how to do that, which is yeah. our topic, right? Of yeah. like uh, you've got a growth goal. Now yeah. what really, right? Yeah. I mean, every year we go through kind of the planning by brand. And as an example, if a brand says, okay, we want to add, we think we should add 20 units in 2024. Or if a brand says, I want to add 50 or I want to add four, whatever the number is, as a marketer, you need to come back and say, well, how are we going to do that? And it's it's collaborative, right? There could be, you know, you have have some you're going to add and then you have to plan for, well, some are going to fall out at the bottom. So all of those numbers are kind of, you bring them together, but as a marketer, you want to look at how many can I add? How can I affect that growth goal? And for the most part, it's a numbers game and it, it's an equation, but you have to come back to leadership and say, you have 20 to add let's, using round numbers. You can use a zero-based budgeting process and that here's the 20, or you can say, well, to get to 20, you have to basically do all the inputs. I know that I need this number of leads based on my close ratio last year. I'm going to bring in you know, this number of leads to get to this number of qualified leads based on the number that the sales team is going to bring through the process and their close ratio. This is the budget I need to get to that goal. And that's pretty much what we do at Home Franchise Concepts for each brand. And then again, we'll look at what's the attrition we expect, how many resales do we have to put on top of that? And then what's the ROI number? And that's pretty much what we present to the brand president, the CFO, and the CEO. Yeah, awesome. So, I mean, essentially, quick and quick and dirty summary, whatever that goal is you've been given, you've got to understand a couple of key metrics. What is your close ratio? What's your maybe your lead book ratio, your schedule? Yes. Ratio, and then, then work backward from those numbers and say, okay, well, that means my funnel's got to expand. I've got to have 3,000 candidates come in so I can get to uh, six closed deals or whatever those numbers are for you guys. Exactly. And then we'll also look at our average cost per territory because we know what, based on our historical cost per territory, that also affects the number. 
Um, and then we're trying to obviously bring that number down. So ultimately, there's some key inputs to get to the output of the recommended budget. And sometimes you just can't get to that budget. Sometimes the budget's so unrealistic that I know in one of our brands, as an example, um, the recommended budget based on the growth goal was like three times the, the number that was ever spent before on this brand in history at Home Franchise Concepts when I uh, presented this equation, if you will. And so we weren't never going to get anywhere close to that number. So we kind of did both. We used the equation kind of pushing the number and then pulling the number. And we kind of came somewhere in the middle. That's really all you can do. You feel like because a lot a lot of marketers feel like they just don't have the, the power behind their voice to convince the executive team that we need to maybe reevaluate our goals. Uh, right. But have, have you have you been able to use that kind of just math, this, this, this thought process you just described to then educate and, and consult with your executive team and make sure that you're it sounds like you've done it just recently, maybe, but that, how to a younger marketer who might be a little bit like concerned or maybe doesn't feel like they have the cloud of a Marcy K, right? Like, how do they, how can they use this to make sure they're getting realistic goals? Yeah. So a couple of things. One, if you don't have the historical data, you could use um, Franchise Update Media's annual um, uh, AFDR, the annual franchise development report that they publish at their franchise leadership and development conference. So we pulled in some of those numbers in 2023 to kind of show some comparatives to where our historical data was against those industry benchmarks. In fact, we're pulling those industry benchmarks into our online dashboard. We use Domo for our um, business intelligence, if you will, our BI reporting. And that really helped to set expectations. So at the end of the day, you're using your data and your projections to set expectations. And like I said, one using the example of one of our brands was so far off that the recommendation using the you know formulaic ap approach, if you will, just we we weren't going to get the dollars using the formula because historically home franchise concepts had not spent um, franchise development marketing on that brand anywhere close to what the formula had said we needed. So we had to kind of come to a compromise. But at the end of the day, if you set the expectation to leadership to say, well, this is what you need to get that that not that number. Either you need to adjust the number down or you need to give us more money. And if neither of those is possible, you need to then just set the expectation that the money is going to get you to this number. And that's what marketing can get you. And then outside of that, we have other channels like referrals, franchisee referrals. We have a huge referral program here at Home Franchise Concepts. Now, yes, there's dollars involved in that referral program, but there's not outbound marketing that necessarily needs to use, you know, paid channels and, and the like. So again, if you're a marketer that doesn't have the historical data, you can use the AFDR, the Annual Franchise Development Re Report, to, to establish benchmarks until you get your own historical data. And then in terms of selling to leadership or getting the buy-in to leadership, you just need to establish the expectations. Um, but I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but again, I like to, to share with my team and leadership, you know, the data doesn't lie. Like you need to, the data needs to inform your decisions, but when you're expecting growth, you have to invest in marketing. And, and again, unless you have decided and the expectations are you're going to use low cost or no cost marketing, which there are channels available to do that, but that's only going to get you so far. Oh yeah. And, and a lot of those no cost, low cost marketing tactics kind of require you to have some footprint and some penetration in the market and some yeah, it, I mean, brand awareness people, and yeah, people need to know who you are and understand who you are to inquire about that brand as an opportunity. 100% agree. Yeah, it's hard to do a referral program with your franchise owners when you have three units. Like that doesn't of work. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you guys get the idea. There are some things that are easier for Marcy to pull off than for you potentially, but but put these things into practice early. If you set right. expectations with your franchisees as they're coming on board, hey, this is going to be the best and the toughest experience of your life. And you're going to be you're going to build independence. You'll know people that are probably looking for the same thing. Keep them in mind and let us know if you know, you know, if you see that idea with every new franchise you bring on board as part of your onboarding, then when you ask them for referrals, they've already mentally been primed for it. They probably have somebody in mind. So exactly. even if you're three units and you're selling three a year, you can still do it. You just won't get 30 referrals a year. And that's also just fine. But if you get one and when you're that small, that's a home run because those close pretty high. So uh, anyway, we can, we can move yeah. on. Another podcast topic for another time, how to build a referral program. <laughs> right? 
Right. So tell me a little bit about channels, Marcy, because I mean, obviously you're with 10 different concepts. You're managing probably quite a few, I'm guessing quite a few standardized channels and maybe some unique ones. How do you, how do you choose the marketing channels that you want to go after for FranDev? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some, you know, lowest common denominator, if you will, or some um, like fundamental channels that most franchise development marketers are going to call on or include in their marketing plan, whether it's, you know, your standard pay-per-click or your franchise portals or, you know, managing your your franchise website through SEO and, and content and all of that. And we use all of the above. I think the most important thing is to know who your target audience is and where you can find them most successfully. Um, at the end of the day, it's an integrated approach. Not one channel is going to be the silver bullet and that's where you're going to get all of your leads that become qualified leads or what we call marketing qualified leads or MQL. Some um, some people might say sales qualified leads that will get through, through your sales funnel and um, those are all that you're closing. So if you just decided to, to make it really elementary and probably a really bad example, I'm going to put all my money on franchise portals and those are going to be the leads that I'm going to get and I'm not going to spend dollars on any other channel. You're probably not going to have a successful year and hit your, your growth goal um, at the most affordable cost per territory, because ultimately that's where you're going to measure the, the ROI for your franchise development dollars. If you want to be at on industry benchmark, if you will. So uh, it needs to be an integrated approach. The portals will support your website, which will support uh, you know other lead channels, paid media, et cetera. And that doesn't even include if you decide to go with um, broker or consultant networks as well. Um, and we try all of them at, at every brand level. And again, as you said, sometimes we might bolt on a direct mail program depending on the brand and their strategy. Uh, we may do more um, email marketing for some than others. Not not talking about the nurturing because all of our brands were doing the traditional nurturing once once they become a lead. But just to bring them in as a new lead, there's the add on channels, if you will, depending on the brand. Yeah, no, no, I totally hear you. I, I'm curious. Um, brokers is 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 an oft uh, debated discussion among marketing uh, teams. Uh, because because sometimes marketing teams feel like, well, I don't, it's brokers. I don't, I don't market to brokers. They're already part of our network. But uh, I would love to get some insights from you of, as a marketing pro, how do you get involved in the broker networks? Because some people see that as just a biz dev function and they don't let, they don't get involved with marketing. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. It's interesting. So I can tell you how we do this at home franchise concepts, but taking a step back, I, I think that there is a, a variety of, um, opinions on franchise development and whether there are some there are some companies that are 100% lead gen through organic channels, 100% lead gen through broker or consultant networks, and I would say the majority are a combination like we are. Um, I know I um, listened to a panel. I want to say it was at last year's franchise leadership and development conference um, that was specifically on this topic and. Um, and there were leaders on the stage that had those three different structures, right? And um, it's interesting to hear how they approach. And they're, they're brands that are successful in all, all three methods. I only uh, use organic channels for my lead generation, and I do not use any brokers. I only use broker consultants, and then I have a combination. So at Home Franchise Concepts, we have a combination of both. I know when I joined the company, the goal was um, to tilt the scales a bit more towards organic, because as you know, the companies that are using broker consultant networks, they're expensive. There's no doubt about that. It, it costs a lot of money to be part of their inventory. It costs a lot of money to attend their conferences and you pay for their performance, which is a good thing. It's a win-win. You pay for the per performance of a consultant to bring you a warm lead and shepherd them through the process to close that deal. You pay um, you know, for that deal, whatever, you know, that fee is mm -hmm. 20, 30, 50, whatever, whatever the, the deal is for that consultant to bring you or to help you close that, um, that deal. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, my personal opinion is 
managing that combination of organic lead channels and consultant network relationships, I think is the most successful and it works really well for us, including um, or having your marketers, if you're fortunate enough to have a marketing team like we do, and I would imagine most platform brands, um, and I know most of my counterparts at the other platform brands, we manage both. Um, we manage, or, or we are involved in some way, shape, or form of the marketing, whether it's just being involved in communications um, or it's involved all the way. So at Home Franchise Concepts, um, myself and my team support the communication, we support the conferences, and in the future, we may get involved in a deeper level. Um, but we want to make sure that our consultant networks um, know what is happening at Home Franchise Concepts. They understand um, what our brands are about, who we are targeting as the most successful franchise owners, and anything new that happens in our brands. For instance, when we launched Lightspeed Restoration, we wanted to make sure they knew why we launched Lightspeed Restoration, what was different about uh, different and unique about Lightspeed Restoration, and um, again, why what, what um, our parent company, JM Family and JM Holdings, who owns Home Franchise Concepts, private family, um, why they were so invested and um, why they put so much support behind Lightspeed Restoration. And it's important that as the marketer for growth and development of home franchise concepts, that all of our consultant networks were clear um, on the purpose behind you know, launching this new brand. So we definitely are involved. We also have the development team and our sales advisors or our franchise advisors, they manage the relationship. It's their one-to-one -one relationship. So if you're a consultant, Dave, we want to make sure that you know who you go to and who you bring your candidates to. And that certainly isn't the marketing team. That's the development team or the advisors. Yeah, but it's important. If I'm if I'm a broker or a franchise consultant or a coach or yeah, they all like to put different labels. I know they have different terms, but yeah, yeah. consultants is I know the preference. <laughs> yes, yes, the general. So, so let's say yeah. the consultants. Um, if if I understand, if I don't know who I should be going to with my lead, it does make it a little bit more ambiguous. Of like, well, where do I send this particular franchise? Uh, you know, this fr potential franchise owner. So yeah, I think it's sure. you're you're just making it easy to do business with you, and marketing can help with that. For sure, and, absolutely. But you can't build the one-on-one -on -one relationship, which is really the part of the the the, the your sales team, uh, or your franchise yeah. advisors. I think is what you just said. Yes. So, yeah, that that's that's something that marketing can't do uh, because you're not the advisor. But uh, but you certainly can communicate. Hey, for this concept, here's your advisor, and and educate them about the brand, the unique selling propositions. I think you're defining well, like how can marketing get involved there and planning events. You know, obviously, you guys probably have a lot more background than that than the, the franchise advisors do on the team. So just I want to make sure everyone's taking note, like where can marketing and should marketing be involved with brokers if you're working with brokers? I think Marcy just laid out a pretty good playbook for you there, guys. Yeah, I think, again, I think it's we can complement and we can support um, the sales team, whatever the sales team is called for us, it's sales advisors or franchise advisors, and making sure that the consultant networks have the latest and greatest information. So if they're looking at a candidate who may be interested, or if the candidate tells the consultant, I'm interested in the residential cleaning industry, the industry looks interesting, that they go to maids, and I know exactly who to introduce you to. My, my contact at Home Franchise Concepts is Jane Doe, and I'm going to get you to Jane Doe right away. And so that's really where it's a partnership between marketing and development or the, the advisor team. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I want to take one step back because this is uh, becoming a sticky topic for a lot of people. Can we, can we backtrack to portals for just a second as a channel? Back, oh. Backing on up. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, that one. Well, and I, and I want to talk about it because a lot of things with the, the um, FCC one-to-one -one ruling, I think it's going to really shake this up. I'm guessing that yeah. you're, yeah, you're probably on top of that and know what's coming there January 1. I mean, allegedly, yeah. right? Like the government's not the best at deploying on time, but um, it, let's, let's assume that that rule gets put into place in January 1. Uh, yeah. For those who don't, who just really quick high level, one-to-one -one means that anyone who's doing lead generation, uh, there was, there's, a new, there's a new regulation coming out from the FCC about lead generators. They have to have mandated and explicit opt-in per uh for a brand essentially for friend of marketing that they have to say, I want to talk to painter one, here's my permission. I want to talk to line painting, here's my permission. I want to talk to how, how you know, whatever, right? All got you covered, all these different concepts, right? Um, one to one, 
and rent, but right now what's happening with some of these franchise portals is they will, they'll say, Hey, I'm interested in, let's say the tailored closet. And then, and, but then off screen down below, there are like four little check boxes to say, I also want to know about premier garage, concrete craft and Havana clean, but the consumer's not aware of that. It's not an express yeah. option. So anyway, that's, that's going to shake things up a bit. I've had some portals tell me, yeah, we're probably going to see 33 to 50% lead reduction overall volume, but the quality should be much higher because there's an express. Yeah. But Marcy, yeah. you have more background in these things than I do. What do you perceive? This is a little bit of crystal balling together here, but what do you anticipate yeah. we, should, we should see out of the portals when that change happens? Wait, let me grab, let me grab my ball. Oh yeah, just kidding. Yeah, just, <laughs> okay. like, just the crystal um, ball. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's my eight ball. I'm going to rub it. No, <laughs> I think that. Well, so first of all, for us at home franchise concepts, we've been analyzing literally since I came in the door, like every channel. I've been. We have a great analytics team that works for both the consumer marketers and the friend of marketing team, and they're phenomenal. And we have been literally. Um, diving deep in every channel and everything we've been doing since I started. And again, standing up our new BI tool. And the first thing we did was look at our portals, our portal spend by brand um, and everything that we're doing. And the 2023 analysis that we did, we found um, a lot of quantity, but not a lot of quality. But we did find you've heard it called the halo effect or, you know, a lot a lot of different things that it de the working in just portals in general had a positive effect overall for our brands in terms of brand building and improving traffic to our websites. But if we looked at portals, it just as a channel, we did not see, we saw very few leads get to close, come through the, you know, through the sales cycle of new lead to engaging lead to nurtured lead, like how we, you know, our names and in, in our sales process. Regardless, we saw very few that could be attributed for pure attribution, first touch attribution to the portal. But we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We didn't have the crystal ball, you know, really shined up too much yet. And so through that process, we did move some um, dollar allocations around uh, through our portal partnerships, if you will, we let some go, we added some dollars here, we changed some of our programs there, um, but we didn't kill them in total, um, but we continued some of that testing, if you will. At the end of the day, I do think, though, what's going to happen in January, I think it's going to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think our whole focus is on quality. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a numbers game. You need numbers to get to the quality candidate across the finish line and to a close in a successful franchisee long-term. Because we want that lifetime value of that franchisee in your system long-term. But I think it's gonna be a good thing that that one-to-one -one opt in, I want that brand. I think the portals need to step up and make sure that they're delivering a quality program for the franchisors. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I do think in terms of them investing in their own search terms and basically paying for that kind of search results page um, ranking does help um, brands in the long in the long run because we we all compete for those eyeballs yeah. on Google. So um, I, I think, like I mentioned earlier, it's an integrated plan for each of our brands. We have ten brands that want to appear. And and we can't uh, we can't buy the, the the big franchising terms, you know, franchise for sale. And, and just overall, when you were talking about trends earlier, costs are going way up. Our CPLs are totally increasing, so we are not getting as much bang for our buck. And I don't think there's any franchisor that can tell you, oh, I'm getting so much more bang for my buck. I don't buy that if anyone's telling you that no. because our CPLs are way up versus year ago, but our quality leads are way up versus year ago, way up. They, they were at the beginning of the year. They're kind of falling off. I, I think they're kind of normalizing, if you will. So our quality leads are up year over year. Our CPLs are also up year over year. So back to your question on portals to bring it full circle. I yeah. think it's going to be a good thing in January. We haven't abandoned them. We are just optimizing the ones that we're working with. Yeah, as everybody should, when the market's yeah. a little tighter, volumes get lower, uh, quality may, good news is usually when, vo when volumes go down, quality goes up, um, yeah. it's always the case, but uh, it usually means that the more legitimate buyers are actually out there looking with more intent, 
Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I see a lot of the same things you do. There's probably a lot of good opportunities heading our way. But I think so. to your point earlier, when you shared all these channels, your PPC, your portals, your SEO content, brokers and consultants, like I think it's going to become much more important for people to have a good mix uh, because sure. you can't guarantee anything that you did, you know, even in January of this year is going to work in October of this year. It's true. And really quick on the portals. I mean, I don't know the exact number. What are there? Eight of them, nine of them, seven of them. I think they all need to kind of step up their game and continue to innovate themselves and offer unique and creative programs too. I mean, I'm not saying like they need to totally reinvent themselves per se, because that's what they are. They're offering in information to prospective franchise owners. And there's only so many ways you can create that. But I do think the fact that um, this one-to-one -one, uh, request for information, I do think it's, it's an opportunity for um, these companies to um, maybe weed out those that are just outdated, if you will. So, Yeah, I agree. Well, let's talk about organic channels. I, I know that these, you mentioned that you guys had invested a bit more in this side of the business. Uh, how do you how do you recommend brand? Well, first, how do you guys approach it at, at Home Franchise Concepts to build out organic lead channels? Well, as I mentioned when I joined, kind of the goal was we're going to tip the scale a bit. We want to spend less on consultants because of how expensive it is, and we think we can bring in more more franchisees through organic. And in theory, that sounds fantastic, right? Again, back to my franchise industry friends who say I don't use one or the other, I do all organic or all consultants. And as a company who you know uses both, when you're looking at the organic channels and you're just analyzing organic in and of itself, um, it's a tough channel just to be successful in just that channel if we didn't have any consultant networks that we were working in. And so we look at it that way sometimes and I can slice and dice our, our, our Domo dashboard that way. And sometimes just looking at organic, um, the, the quality, and we hear it from our advisors, the quality sucks and I'm getting you know bad information or whatever. We get that because you have to make you know, 300 to one is kind of the average. You're going to get 300 leads in the door to maybe one that you're actually bringing through the sales process. We know we can close them. We know last year we, we closed more um, organic leads actually became franchise owners than in years past. And I want to say two or three years past, although we didn't have the historical data. So we know we can bring in franchisees through these channels. It's just always refining and redefining how uh, what is quality from these organic channels. So let's just single out Google pay-per-click. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, the costs are going up. Google algorithms are changing by the nanosecond, it feels at times. So you have to constantly stay on it. We outsource this function. So we're working with an outside partner. And so obviously there's that factor in that you're working with the partner. You have to put trust in that they know what they're doing. And, and I'm doing that. I'm I'm not suggesting, although I know um, my counterparts in, in other um, platform brands or even um, single brands that many do it in-house. Mm -hmm. um, or um, manage their organic channels, um, paid media in-house, um, even websites and SEO in-house. Um, but we don't uh, choose to do that today. Potentially that's um, an option for us in the future. Um, it takes a lot of work, I guess is what I'm saying. You have to spend time, money, and effort to make sure that these channels are working for you. I believe that it's worth it. It just does take time and effort and constantly analyzing and optimizing. Yeah. Well, this is a, I think it's a conundrum too for the younger brands uh, and yeah. even growing brands that have just limited budgets for marketing. It, it's hard to, well, let's talk about a, a content strategy, right? You want, you want to have organic content. You want to rank you know, organically. Um, that represents hours of effort, not necessarily hard costs you're writing checks out the door for, but you have to have, or you have to have a firm or a partner that's doing this for you regularly. How, do, how, how prevalent is your organic, like your SEO, your content marketing? How how big of a channel is that for you guys versus the paid and the portals and everything else right now? Yeah, I'm glad you separated it because what I was just referring to was paid and, and I should have right. been, been, been clear on that. So separating kind of website organic and then the paid media, 
our or our website and organic side if i'm looking at this and this was like my company I, that's the first thing you want to make sure like you get your house in order i i refer to this internally as like that's our four walls and if someone were walking into your store it's your website mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that you're creating relevant, new and engaging content, because that's how Google is going to reward you. So get your website in order, make sure you have a content strategy, make sure your website is the best it possibly can be before you even layer on paid media. So I would start there. So I should have actually spoken about that first. Yeah. We have the, we have a partner that helps us with that. And that's something I, we definitely have room for improvement here at Home Franchise Concepts. Every day I Take, I talk about this to somebody here. We meet weekly um, as a friend of marketing team, and we are always have on our agenda. Let's talk about the website. Now we have 10 of them. So we need to make sure that obviously, you know, we don't have a, a time in that weekly, meet, you know, touch base meeting, but it is the most important thing you can do for Fran Deb. We are actually up this year right now in or just organic um, leads and form fills on our website. So what we're doing right now is really focusing in on adding blog content, making sure that we have fresh content and any, any um, recognition or awards or anything you can do, any videos. Um, if your brand presidents are on a podcast, like anything that you have that can um, rank and help your, your site rank and be relevant to the search terms that you believe you should go after for a prospective franchisee is so critical. So start there. That to me is like baseline foundation of building your house is your website as if someone was going to open the door and walk into your business. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's funny, a lot of people don't understand how connected uh, the, the organic is, your, your, your on-page SEO with PPC. So if you have, if you have totally. the matching, or yeah, you're, they are I mean, so connected. Yeah, well, you're you're going to pay more because your your ad your ad copy doesn't match your landing page copy, and your score your, your what do they call it your ad score or um, what is it called in PPC and Google uh, where they, they they score your 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 rating like of like the quality of your ad, but a big chunk oh, of that yeah. is how it aligns with the organic page that you're pointing it to. So like I I, I tell people I'm not a marketer. Right? I just I get to see this over and over again. I'm like nope. Fix the back, fix the house first before you add another porch on it. You know, like you gotta, Absolutely. You, you said it's the base. I agree. It is your base yeah, and everyone sure. can invest in it. And Google's penalizing people too for just a word of caution. Uh, everyone jumped on the AI bandwagon. Yeah. If you're using AI to generate content that's B minus content, but it's got keywords in it. They're going to start delisting. They've already started the process of delisting all the pages with B minus type content on it that was clearly written by an intern and a third party that didn't know your brand or like AI without editing and fine tuning. So just beware, like content is king, but it's Marcy, you said it, quality content is king. Google will reward you for that. I just love the way you said that. Make sure that you're spending the right amount of effort to make it good enough that you're not just gonna get penalized for it, but you'll get rewarded with more traffic. For having exactly. High content. exactly, I mean, yeah, we could talk for hours on the whole AI what's positive, what's negative, what you should and shouldn't do. But that's a whole separate conversation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but let's, let's, I want to, if you don't mind, because man, that blew by. Uh, I feel like we could spend another hour talking on this. Uh, you guys do a lot of data analysis. I mean, Domo is founded right here in my backyard, Josh James. You know, so it's a fantastic tool. But you have a lot of insights, but, but you also measure and you test and you optimize and you adjust do you mind maybe sharing with everybody a little bit about that process? Like how, what are you measuring? And then how do you know what to adjust and how do you watch it and make sure you're doing the right thing with your testing? I just think a lot of people there, they don't really have a good process around this. I'd love for you to share as kind of a, a wrap up thought. How are you guys using data to manage the marketing process and adjust? Yeah, well, I think that that's a great question. And, and sometimes you just don't like know what, where to start. Um, I just, a month ago came out, came back from um, a mastermind group session. And we were talking about that specifically working with franchisees. And I'll talk to you about what we do, but when you're working with franchisees, it's so easy 
to get so wrapped up in like qualitative feedback. Like, I don't like that. That's blue. And I wanted purple or, you know, because franchisees can get very emotional about decision and you need to take it down to being very non-emotional and it all about the data. And sometimes you just have to establish that up front before you even have any conversations and saying, okay, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, so for us in Fran Depp, so that just it just reminded me of this conversation working with one particular marketer and they were struggling with getting buy in from um, their franchisees. So just keep keep it about the data. Obviously, someone can tell you their opinion, but if, if you don't ground it in what what your KPIs are and what does success look like and make it about the data, it can be very much. Well, I want that to be purple. And, you know, we said it was going to be blue and I like blue better. Anyway, back to the data. For every campaign, um, every channel, we, we try to set um, expectations and look at, well, what's industry benchmark? So for instance, we just launched um, a new email platform. Um, we're using Mass Mailer, which ties into Salesforce. We're a Salesforce shop. And um, we basically re redid all of our um, lead, lead new lead campaigns and our nurturing campaigns. But we wanted to know what, what's the industry standards for what we should expect for open rates, click-through rates for what we had in our email um, campaign? So that's just an example of, okay, everyone does it. Everyone sends out emails after, you know, you get a lead in or you nurture them, but how do we know we're doing it right? Uh, mm -hmm. Should you send four? Should you send one? When, how, what's the frequency? What, what's the, the cadence? Should you send one a week? Should you send three a week? And it was kind of like, Oh, well, we've always been doing it this way. I'm not a big fan of we've always done it this way, so we should keep doing it this way. So everyone on my team and, and even in the whole dev team, they're probably tired of me saying like, well, why? Like, what's the, how do you know we're doing it right? So I'm a big, like I push back and I want it to be, I want our decisions to be grounded in data and at least based on some type of industry benchmark um, so that was one recent um, occurrence. So we're looking at industry benchmarks and then we're going to adjust um, or not. We might prove out, it might prove out that what we're doing is working great or we're doing better. So that's just one instance. Um, I will tell you pay, paid media is a little bit easier because you have a lot of what's called soft metrics and then you can have metrics that tie into your campaign. So again, as I mentioned, like open rates, click through rates, those are what's called more soft metrics because I like to say like, okay, if you have a click through, what does that mean? How do you translate that into success for your business? Um, you know, percentages of things. I have I had a mentor earlier in my career tell me you can't take percentages to the bank. So like if you have like a percentage, okay, 10% did what? Okay, but what does that really mean? So I guess at the end of the day, I like to make sure that everything we're doing, we have a standard KPI list, and then we know what those KPIs really mean. And so that if I were talking to our CFO or CEO, I can easily translate those metrics into what matter to them. Or if I was talking to the president of, you know, kitchen tune-up and bath tune-up or the president of Two Maids and Aussie Petmobile, I could easily translate the results to something that matter to them. So that's really my advice when it comes to data is create KPIs that you can make adjustments based on the results of what you're trying to measure and also have KPIs that make sense if you were having a conversation with the highest leader of that company or the leader that you report into and they could be different. So your leader may have KPIs or data that matters and then the leader of the company might have different KPIs that matter to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting, I mean, this, again, I think KPIs, we could probably spend an hour talking about this. Uh, There's one I thing I, love, <laughs> uh, I know, but like EOS, even if you're not running EOS, the concept here that I love that they that they that we operate by is whatever the, the executive goal is or the corporate goal, there should be an right. alignment, not only in the, the, the tasks or the rocks that you're working on each quarter, but also the KPIs you're measuring that lead right yes. up to that number. So what you're saying is make sure whatever your KPIs are, that they're relatable to the executive agenda or executive goals. If they're not easily relatable, then it's an uphill battle all the time. All the time. And I've seen, you know, depending on who, who in your organization is managing a campaign or working on a project, sometimes that they don't know how to connect them. So if you have that conversation up front, 
And at different points within the project, key milestones, let's say you're checking in, you launched, let's just say a pay-per-click campaign and it's three months later, ha have those conversations to make sure that if someone is asking, well, how do I know that that campaign's working, that you have those check-in points. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Marcy, you've been phenomenal. Thanks for sharing so many great insights and experience and wisdom with us. If somebody wanted to reach out to you and, and just connect offline, I know you're actually quite amenable to it. What's the best way for somebody to find you, maybe connect with you and, and have a conversation with you? Well, you certainly can find me on LinkedIn, um, but you're welcome to email me. It's my first name, um, dot last name at gohfc.com. Well, Marcy, you're fantastic. Thanks for being a great leader in the industry and do, trying to do things right all the time. I, I really look up to the way you're doing things at Home Franchise Concept. Thanks for being on the on the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. This was fun. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.